great. Hi, everybody. I'm Holly Rosenfink. I'm a member of WJC. I'm the head of the World Jury Committee. I'm also on the Board of Trustees, and I am a communications consultant and a journalist. And on behalf of WJC, I'm so honored to be joined by Dikla Barkai, the executive producer of Sheet Soul today. Welcome, Dikla. Thank you so much Thank for being you. here. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for inviting me. It's such a pleasure and an honor. Such an honor. Yeah, for me too. In a moment, everybody, we're going to be joined by another Westchester Jewish Center member, Jack Steinberg. Um, he was a New York reporter for a quarter century, and while he mostly wrote about education, his beat for the paper from 2003 to 2009 was television. So he's perfect for this conversation. I also want to give a shout out to everyone at WJC, um, along with the Adult Education Committee, the Sisterhood, the Israel Committee, and of course, Rabbi Arnowitz, who is here with us today. And now I'd like to kick it off to Jack. Thanks, Holly, and thanks, everyone, and thanks, Dikla. Um, so for those of you joining us, uh, whether you're a member of Westchester Jewish Center in Mamaroneck or, or a family member or new to us, uh, we're so grateful to have you with us and uh, only sorry that we can't be welcoming you to our physical space, but we know we can uh, give you a sense, uh, for those of you who are new to us, uh, to the warmth and, and vibrancy of our community. Um, so one edit we're going to make right at the top. We are scheduled to be together with you for about an hour, um, but in the spirit of Jewish time, uh, Dikla has agreed to stay with us for an extra 15 minutes or so. So for those of you who stay with us till 1115 on the east coast of New York time, um, Dikla will be joining us uh, till then. So thank you, Dikla, for doing that. Um, we're going to start out uh, with Holly and I asking Dikla questions for about 45 minutes or so. Um, we're going to intersperse those questions with uh, a few video clips that Dikla has brought with her. And even for those of you who have watched every minute of the series, as, uh, as Holly and I have, um, I guarantee you that one of those clips is a clip that you have not seen because it was an outtake uh, from one of the first two seasons. It's not a clip from season three. Uh, we couldn't get uh, Dikla to show that much leg, <laughs> uh, but we've got a clip that, that we're sure you haven't seen. Um, so, uh, and also we're gonna be recording this conversation. Um, if you have questions, as Holly and I are asking our questions, please put those questions in the chat. Um, remember your fellow uh, participants will be seeing them as well. And, and then during the last 15, 20 minutes or so, I'll be picking out as many of those questions in the chat as I can uh, to ask on our behalf. Um, and with that, we're, um, we're going to get started. So, uh, did, did, Dikla, as uh, Holly mentioned, is the executive producer of Stiesel, uh, a, a fantasy job, I'm sure, to many of us on this uh, call. Um, her recent TV credits include The Attaché, The Psychologist, and The Educator. I will leave it to you to see if there's a, a theme that runs through those uh, titles and projects. Um, her film credits include uh, A Summer Story and When Shall We Kiss. Um, she will soon be on a series uh, that centers on the Israeli Prime Minister called Bibi. Uh, the series is on Israeli journalist Ben Kaspitz, The Netanyahu Years, um, a best-selling biography. Uh, in two seasons, she still won a slew of Ophir Awards, the Israeli Emmys, um, including for Best Drama and for Best Actor, Best Directing, and Best Script in a Drama Series. Uh, Dikla, um, welcome. Um, we're going to kick off before our first uh, question for you uh, with a clip, and uh, it is the dream scene. And, uh, we all, uh, if, if you weren't hearing that scene, you're not alone, uh, but uh, the, the subtitles were helpful to us. But uh, Dikla, I, I have a feeling that all of us on the call uh, saw that scene. Um, help give us some insight into sort of where it came from and, and what the thinking was behind it. Well, um, I chose to show this a beautiful scene because it has a special place in my heart. At the time, I was having doubts about staying in television. After a very long period of reading many scripts and not finding something I could relate to. One day, Ori alone, the writer, gave me a script to read. And I remember I read the first scene, that scene. I, I wish we could see it. And I immediately cleared my table, took everything else of my table, and knew this is what I want to work on, that I'm going to invest all of my time and effort in this now. I must tell you that I can watch this scene over and over again. It's never enough for me. 
So um, I didn't know then why I felt it so strong. Now I'm analyzing it and I understand more. I think that in this scene, we see Akiva missing his mother and his mother sitting there in the restaurant missing Kigel. And we feel these people homesickness. Immediately we identify with them. I'm not a Haredi person. I hardly knew anything about their life when I first read the script, but I identified with them in an instant and I could feel this homesickness myself. We understand, understand through this scene something that is bigger than the scene itself. One thing is the longing of the Haredi community that they feel for the life they had before. Secular people in Israel might tell you that Haredi people are primitive or narrow-minded, but when you watch this first scene, you understand the same thing differently. Their longing, longing for a time in the past and the way of life they had before, and you see them differently. The modern world could be very frightening for Haredi people, so they try to hold on to the past. You see the man these days wearing this long coat in the, in the summer. Israeli summer could be really hot. The women wearing their wigs and their food is the same food as their grandparents used to eat. And all you think, all you think about is how they aren't progressing with time. But as Shulim says to Akiva in this first scene, when Akiva describes his dream to him about his mother and the Eskimo men there, and Shulim asks him, what do you know about Eskimos? Have you ever been there? So I need to ask myself the same thing. What do I really know about people who live different lives from me? If you get closer, you begin to understand things. Once, I met a Haredi man who told me that Haredi people are like those who sit in the train in the last coach. They are riding with us, but they are behind. So, um, and I think it's even stronger than that. It's not only the Haredi people, it's all of us. We all can feel this homesickness for something, especially for a sense of belonging. Oren Diratan, the writer, of such a special way to describe this world to us. I once I just heard a podcast the other day and 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 it was there was a nice definition there for creativity. Creativity, they said, is an expectation that is fulfilled in a way we haven't seen before. This this is what they did here, I think. It's the same thing as we expect it to be but fulfilled in a way we haven't seen before. You don't feel that you're watching a series about Haredi people. You just experience it, their life, their emotions. This is not a scene about Akiva and his mother. It's just them and the situation they are in without trying to say something about it. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. Saying, hey, yeah, I, sorry. I no, no, this is amazing. And it's, uh, I've already feel like I've gained new insight into why um, the, the universal themes uh, that uh, are sort of transcendent regardless of your belief or, or where you sit in the Jewish spectrum uh, is, is, is one of the many yeah. of this series. Take, take us into the writer's room uh, for a moment. What was it like trying to both be respectful of the Haredi, I imagine, but also make sure that the universality of this project uh, remained intact? How did, how did you find that balance as writers? Yes, I think that, um, I think that they just, they, they didn't have any, any rules there in their writing room. They just, wrote it from their heart. And, um, and I think they were really looking for the truth in everything they, they wrote there. And then, and, and it, I, you know, we also, we didn't want it to be
exist in, exist in this world, but at the same time, they didn't want to make an exotic or want to bring us to uh, in Uh, not to bring an exotic world, not to bring this point of view that watch them from the outside. And they, you know, in the first episode, they even, um, they, we have their uh, scene that uh, Akiva uh, takes Shulem with him, with the children of the, of the school, and they're going to, to the zoo. And they even think that when Orin Yonatan wrote this scene in the zoo from the, from, the, from this episode, they wanted us, they wanted to, to tell us something about their point of view. I think they tried to say, don't look at, at people as animals in the zoo. Maybe, I'm not sure, but, uh, but I think that's what they try to make, to make there. Um, that's it <laughs> for this. Uh, uh, again, um, I, I, if you want. Uh, we'll look at that zoo scene differently as a result of the insight you've just given us. Uh, Holly, I think the next question. Yeah, it's my assumption. They don't, they yeah. never told it to me. Yeah. But but I think they tried to, to tell us something about our point of view in, in televisions and in life itself. And uh, not to judge people, not to look at them. Uh, I think that's what they try to, to do here. To, to do here. That, just to bring people. It's not even a series about Haredi people. It's just a series that takes place in the Haredi society. But it's not about what they are, it's about who they are. Wonderful, thank you, Dikla. Language is used beautifully in Shitzel. It incorporates Yiddish, Haredi Hebrew, and the characters yeah. sometimes employ religious terms drawn from Aramaic. We now have a clip that is very, about this very topic called The Clip of the Language, and afterwards we'll ask you, Dikla, to comment on language throughout Sitzel. Hold on, please. Please give us some commentary on the use of language in the show. Yes, so uh, language is a huge theme in Sitzel. Actually, there are a few languages in Sitzel. There's Hebrew, of course, Hebrew, which is Hebrew mixed with Yiddish, commonly used in, only in Mashiarim. And there's Yiddish, the language that the Haredi people speak, the language spoken in this diaspora. So it has a very nostalgic element to it, but also a negative reaction to it by a secular Israeli who don't want this element from the past. So we had a debate with the managers of the channels whether or not to include Yiddish in the series. And if so, how much? But as we always decided which Tissel, we opted for the truth. This is the language these people speak. And luckily, the managers of the channel gave us the freedom to decide. And there's another language, a very special language, that we and the time, the creators invented in this series. Maybe the most uh, special one. And we and Yonatan use words as instruments. They play with them. They use words to define character and their world. In other series, in order to understand the character, you need to know a little bit about their history, what they do. In Stiefel, you just need to hear them say one sentence and you immediately understand the character and their perspective on life. This is the way of the writer to express, to express their point of view. And this is how we can see their perspective on the character and the perspective of the character on, on life, mostly in a humor way. So when Shulam says absolutely about everything, good morning, absolutely. It gives him authority, which is really important for him. Shulam uses this word to have more authority, but he uses it in unexpected moments. He wants to gain more authority. It's important for him to control his family, his relationship. But when you get to know him from the inside, you know that it's not that important for him. It's something he uses because he needs to manage things. It's more about the image than about the real things. It's a bit of a show. But he also has a special approach to life that nothing is really that serious. He never takes anything too seriously. 
even though he uses strong words. So when he uses absolutely not only when things are so important, but also for every everyday thing like good morning, it's a way of showing that he doesn't really think that anything is absolute in this world. Nothing and nobody is too important in this world. He takes things seriously, but at the same time, everything is with the humor. And this knowledge that nothing is that important. At the end of the day, he doesn't really take himself that seriously. Um, Thank you, Dikla. So the, the, yeah. Are you finished? Yeah, yeah. Okay. I don't want to interrupt you because you have so many amazing things to say. About it. Um, it's all, it, Please do. Okay. <laughs> um, Shitzel exposes the world of the Haredim, but this family could be all of our families, really, from any religion, grappling with all the things that we deal with every day. Was that something that was intentional um, and a prototype that this show was trying to un unveil? Yeah. I, I, sorry, I didn't really understand your question. Right. I mean, were, were you, you were focusing on a Haredi family, but it was really an emblem of all of us. And is that, was that something you were trying yes. to say that this family is just like all everyone? Yes, I guess so. Mm -hmm. um, the family, it, as, as I said before, uh, we really tried hard not to, not to focus uh, on, the, on the, the, the ceremonies and the things that, uh, that define the Haredi world. All the stories, if you look carefully, you see that all the stories, is, it, they're about parenting, about love, about fear, about loneliness. And uh, it's something that everybody can experience. Even though the world is very, very local and the situation is very specific. It's a very specific family in, this, in a very specific uh, neighborhood, in, in a very specific city. And it's not a universal thing, but I found that uh, whenever you try to 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 be as as local you are, is as universal you get. Uh, and um, the more they are specific and tell a true story about true people without trying to um, to look at them in in a way is in this way of Haredi people, then they speak for all of us. And I think every, every one of us can find himself there. They can find himself dealing with these kind of troubles in life. Absolutely. And not only troubles. Absolutely. <laughs> and this show also touches on the Haredi response to Zionism in Israel a great deal. Um, how important was that to you and the writers? Well, we we tried not to go there very much to this direction, not to not to give a statement at all without to without judgment, and not to to say anything about how the Haredi are um, against Israel or pro, pro Israel, but um, but of course it's there. And uh, we know the scene, for example, about uh, the Independent Day, and when Shuler is looking at the, at the airplanes from the window, and he tells the, the other teachers not to allow the kids to watch this airplane, this Air Force planes. So because it's it's from the uh, the country, from uh, it's from Israel and the uh, Zionist country, which. The common um, belief is that they all against it, of course. But for himself, it, it's also a way that he doesn't really take himself that seriously. For himself, he, he, he goes out uh, through the window and, and he looks at these Air Force airplanes and, and he doesn't make a, a great deal out of it. That, in that way, I think this, um, this attitude he has uh, tell us about about people who live normal lives and doesn't really they don't deal with this major problem and with with major belief. They just want, like most people, 
they want to live their life. So they have, you know, they have their, their attitude and they have their beliefs and the way that uh, many people think around them. And yes, they cooperate with it, but it's not, um, it's not that they hold it very, very uh, strong against Israel. They do, but they still live their life and they have more important things in life. But this is the way that Shtisel looks at these things. It's, it doesn't re reflect all the, the Haredi people, of course. I'm, I'm sure that there, there are many Haredi people that uh, hold these beliefs very strongly or the opposite. We chose to stay in this daily life and with uh, these stories that are more common to all of us and that our life built from them um, more than the ideologic um, world. Great, and speaking of Haredi, what was their reaction to the show and also from the non-Haredi um, communities in Israel? It, actually, it was amazing to to get this surprising um, uh, response from the Haredi people because they don't even have a television at home or didn't at the time in 2013 when the when the show first came out came out. Sorry, so um, it, it was amazing uh, to get the positive response and so many response from them and. Uh, they they really somehow it went viral on the kosher cell phone in the Haredi society. Someone actually videoed videoed it on their television and sent it to their friends, and everybody started watching it. And they know that the religion's viewers felt a strong connection to the series when they watched it. They saw, I think, they saw themselves in in it. And um, I must say that. I personally feel that since I started working on this series, I will never look at the religious man the, the way I looked at him, at the, at him before. So it was also a great thing and surprise to get the response from also from the other side. And we once said that it was like a love life. It, it, it felt that it's like, um, for example, once we had a, uh, Nigun, a music that Chulim sings in, in one of the episodes. And a few days after it was aired on, on the Israeli television, we got to, um, a video from a wedding and we heard the music there. And it's uh, music that we invented. It was not um, existed before. So it was amazing to get to, get, to see this wedding, a real Haredi wedding playing this Stiefel uh, music and Doris said it was like, it felt like it's a love letter. He wrote them and they answered him back. <laughs> so, um, well, thank you. Jack, you take it from here. Um, I think we, uh, we have another clip. Is that right, Holly? It is. Let's, let's do it. Okay, so this is a clip from episode seven, season one. Had a, 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 I could got a lump in my throat just uh, remembering it. Um, to give us a little bit of insight into what went into it and, and what your takeaway was to that powerful moment. Yes, um, actually I wanted to talk about the women in Stiefel through this scene. Because when we think about the women in the Orthodox society, we immediately think about kind of cliche. Um, in Stiefel, we make a huge effort to bring the truth, as I said, and, and to show the world as it is without judgment. So, and I think eventually the women in Stiefel um, are very strong women, even though this world um, doesn't, the, the rules or the behavior of, of, the, of the society doesn't really support that. Um, when we talk about women in the Haredi society, of course, there are no equal rights, but there are always more options to reality, as we see in Tisel. Life is not uh, black and white, and even not inside Nasharim. We can find other lay layers of the story and understand the, compl the complexity, sorry, the complexity of, of this life. 
And when we do so, it brings us closer to each other, even if, if our lives are seem to be far from each other. So what we think when we think about women in the, in the Haredi society, and the, the writers of Stiefel, they gave us some alternative options. And I think in this scene, um, we see the, the wife of Shulem and his dead wife, of course, and his mother, they did something for him. But when he discovered he, they, they uh, paid their, his salary in advance, but when he, dis when he discovered it, of course, he felt very humiliated by it. And um, he felt that they treated him like he was a little boy. But as his mother say in, in, the, in the end of the scene, she says about his wife that she did it because she wanted a strong man in the house. She wanted a strong husband. So she, and, um, and she says that she remembered his father, that when he stopped working, he really, it was really um, his way going down and, and he felt very bad and uh, he was not the man he used to be. Uh, so we, she wanted something else for him, but I chose this scene because this circle of, of um, power of between men and women in this society. Yes, there, there is the, the normal behavior, but still there's a choice. You always have a choice. I mean, Stiefel, um, the story of Stiefel knows the way to show us these um, this ways, even inside the society, inside the rules, without breaking the rules. So, um, I think that if you think about the other stories about Giti, about Ruhami, you you see a very strong women in this society that keep the women in, in their places, which is not equal to a man. And, um, and one of the reasons, of course, that uh, works so well is the casting. And so let, let's pan yeah. back a little bit. Um, many of the actors were, were unknown in Israel, in addition to being unknown in uh, America as well, although some of them were quite well known, uh, but not necessarily as actors. Um, can you talk a little bit about how you assembled this cast and, and how they've sort of reacted to their fame? Um, yeah, we just made a lot of auditions, really. We, 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 it was a long process to understand the, the, to understand who will be the right actor for the, for the character. And from these auditions, we learned about the characters also. Um, but, and when we chose them finally, eventually, and um, we discovered that the, they brought something even bigger than what we, had when we read the script it, themselves. And then, um, yes, most of them, they were unknown. Or for example, Dovele, he was very famous in Israel, still very famous, but he didn't be, do this kind of uh, acting. He was a comedian, comedian and they did the, um, other, other kind of shows. And uh, this is his first role, big, very big role that is that he did as an actor um, um, in this kind of drama. And it was amazing for us to watch him doing it. It, it. it was like a magic, really. When I read the script, I thought that I don't know anyone who could do this kind of, who could, be, who could act as, as they, they wrote it. I, I thought that they wrote it in such a special way that nobody could do it. But then when we watched Dovele, it, he brought something even bigger than we expected. And his humor and his sensitivity and his, um, the way he walks in this world and the way he catches things and the way he was related to Shulem and parenting Akiva, it was amazing for us, for us to, to watch him and we felt 
very lucky, really. We felt it was a miracle. And with all the actors, with all the other actors, sometimes, you know, uh, um, people meet them on the streets. Of course, the secular people, they know them. These days, they know them more. But, but secular people, they used to watch television. And they, and they watch television, and they, they know the difference between actor and, and real people. But uh, Orthodox people who doesn't have television, sometimes they met the actors on the street and they were so surprised to see them without the wigs and without the clothes. And they couldn't believe that they're secular or actors. So it was maybe a little bit sad for them, but for us it meant that they, 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 they played, they act so in, in such a realistic way and with all of their hearts in it, and that everybody believes it, it's the real thing. So we're yeah. lucky to have them. Absolutely, yes. <laughs> and, and, and let's talk about the costumes, um, which you just mentioned a little bit. Um, how did your costume team determine the wardrobe? How did they, sorry? The costume team determined the wardrobe. You you mean the the costume scene or the costume the costume in, All in of general? The for the Haredi. Yes, well, it was amazing because um, we first thought it would be very very easy because it's the same costume, the same clothes for everybody. All the men are dressed the same, so it doesn't matter. It will be very easy in that matter. But it wasn't that easy. As we made the research and we went out to the street and examine how people dress and what they wear. And we, we began to understand that there is many differences. And the hats, if they're high or, or low, and the, what, are, um, what are their shape, everything means something. The coat, if they're long or short, and everything means something. It means if you belong to this stream or another stream of the Orthodox society, it means that um, is it Saturday or just a normal weekday? Um, there's a special way of how you, if you have a long coat, for example, it, there's a special way when you sit to, to take off the jacket that, so you will not fall when you sit on it. So there's, there were so many little things that we had to learn about the, the clothes. And uh, there's a story also about, um, about Neta, who played Gitti. And all of her skirts were in, in this high of, not until the end of the leg, until the floor. It was in the mid, mid leg. So, um, so Neta asked, why can't she just wear a skirt that it's long enough, very long, until she thought it would be, it would be more nice for her. But they said, no, that it's not allowed because when you wear a long, long, long skirt and you're going on, a, you step on the stairs or something, then you have to take it with your hand and take it a little bit higher and, and hold it. And that might be a little bit too sexy for a woman. So they, it was not allowed. So there were so many small details that we discovered through this only clothes things <laughs> about the... And, and what about the food? Yeah. I mean, let's talk about the food for just a moment, the food in the restaurant, <laughs> the food on Shabbat. Um, <laughs> what extent is the food a character in its, in its own right? Yeah. Good. Well, they eat a lot, huh? In, in, in they, they, smoke, they smoke a lot too. <laughs> yeah, smoke and eat like like human. Eat and smoke. Yeah. Um, yes, it's amazing. Uh, the the through through the food. I think um, there's so many things to say about people about their homesickness, about their um, feelings. Um, somehow it's all there. For example, in, this, in the first uh, season, 
shouldn't have this kind of relationship with a woman, with Aliza, his secretary. But he doesn't, he just go to eat, to eat with her. So I guess if it was in the, if it was a secular series, maybe they would do other things. But uh, in Stiefel, they just eating together. So this is, and, and just eating together say so much about them, about their relationship about her cooking for him. And you don't need to say anything else that uh, we used to see on other shows. And um, it, and, and it's just a dish, but there's a whole story. <laughs> so um, the, the theme of homesickness has run through this entire conversation from the beginning. And, and I think yeah. the, um, all of us are feeling homesick uh, for Stiesel. And uh, we, we oh. met <laughs> We're, uh, we're, we're looking forward to it coming back. And I do want to make sure that everybody on the call knows that there will be a third season of Stiesel. Is that correct, Tikla? Yes, uh, yes, yes. And that may be news to some folks. And uh, we've, if you're on social media, you've seen some of the um, um, actors, such as Shira Haas, with her script from season three, which was very exciting for many of us. And uh, also enjoyed seeing her in Unorthodox, which... Uh, uh, but um, just to remember, for those of us on the call where we left off, and, and we um, thank those of you um, who are in the audience for being indulgent of our uh, technology. We're a uh, low-tech uh, shop here. Uh, but we're going to try <laughs> to show you uh, the final scene. So this would be uh, season two, um, episode uh, it's very powerful uh, for, for, for all of us, Dikla, to be able to watch that with you and the sort of parallel narratives <laughs> that were happening. Um, help us uh, understand uh, what you all as writers and producers were hoping to accomplish with uh, those final moments. Um, well, it's, it is um, a very special moment. And I, I chose to speak to speak about Shulam here in this scene, because um, there, there's something that the writers in Stiesel, they do a lot and, and makes us feel very close to the characters and maybe feel close to each other. They, they know how to bring how hearts close to each other. And I think they do it by the focus they put on the intention of the character because people do bad things and good things. And then um, normally we judge people by their, by, by their actions, by the things they do. And when we come to judge ourselves, we judge ourselves by our, our intentions. We always feel very right and we explain to ourselves in, in our heads what were our, our intentions. And in Stiefel, because the writer is putting so, so many, uh, such a big focus on the intention, then there is no good or, or bad things because Shulim here, he, he, he ruined uh, Akiva's painting, this beautiful painting and, and emotional one. And the, we know, we, everybody knows how important is this painting for Akiva and we see Shulam trying to burn it and then takes this color and puts on on the women's head and we know that he's ruined, ruined the that he's ruined the, the painting, but we still we don't we don't judge, judge him. Um, because we understand we understand his intention, we understand his motives. And um, when we understand the the, the motives and the intention, then we lose, we shade all, all of our prejudices and, and what we, and, and the beliefs we came, we came with them um, in advance. And I think in other television series, um, you, you see a lot of shows that um, they just justify your beliefs and, and there's right and wrong and good and bad. And in Stiefel, there is right and wrong, and there is good and bad, and, but some, somehow you don't judge it the same way you judge it in, in, in other series. So um, 
in this scene, we, when we when we see Shulam ruined Akiba's beautiful painting, um, we are not judging him, and we understand him, and we feel also close to his heart at the same time that we understand Akiva. And uh, of course, it's all going in a parallel uh, um, sequence with Akiva and Libby getting finally together uh, in a very special moment. And uh, we're lucky to have this uh, moment and uh, we're lucky that the writers wrote this beautiful scene. And Holly and I are careful to damage uh, what we know will be the masterpiece of your season three, but we, we can't have you here and not at least ask you a few questions. And we don't want them to be in the vein of spoiler alerts, but um, can you tell us, first of all, where are you at in production? We've seen actors with scripts. Have you begun um, actually filming? No, we will begin in July, uh, mid, mid July. Um, so, but it's very, very soon. <laughs> We're working very hard these days on the third season. The scripts are written already almost on the final corrections. And uh, we work hard. In Israel, it's different way of doing, doing things and the uh, productions are not that easy. And, uh, and we didn't expect it to be in summer. Uh, we thought it would be before the summer, but the corona, the COVID-19 came and we had to postpone the shooting. So uh, it will not be that easy to wear all the wigs and the coats for the actors and uh, the beard, you know, they, the beard, if you just sweat, then uh, it's not that easy. But we will do it, and uh, it will be a beautiful season. <laughs> Another yeah. one. I hope so. I hope that you will think so as well. well we, we are cheering you on and excited. Um, has Netflix committed to uh, even a tentative date of when we might see uh, season three in the United States? No. Not at all. I know it will be on Netflix, but they can, I don't know when. It's not confirmed yet. Now, we, we saw an image of Shira Haas uh, with her script, uh, so we, one can assume she is back. Um, can you share with us yeah. some of the other cast members and characters, again, without giving too much away, who are, who are coming back? Most of them. Most of them there, and um, it's the same family. Akiva and Shulem, of course, Yiti and Lita with the kids, all the Weiss family, all the Stiesel family, Nukhem. Uh, we will meet them all there again. <laughs> uh, again, yeah, a lot of us on the call didn't necessarily assume that or not, and, uh, and that's exciting to us. Um, so before we um, read you some of the questions from the chat box, uh, you were very gracious to <laughs> with us uh, an outtake, something from the first two seasons um, that were not that was not shown. Again, we're going to ask uh, audience for your indulgence with our technology, um, but we're going to try to give you a, a look at this. Outtake. Thank you for that gift uh, on behalf of Westchester Jewish Center. Tell us um, why it didn't make it into season two. Well, it was uh, in the beginning of the fifth uh, episode, and it was such a long episode, and um, mostly the beginning of the episode was very long, and we felt that the story should be, should run faster. And, um, and I'm still not sure it was the right decision because we love this scene. I hope that you could make, you really I watched it good, and I'm, I'm not sure it, uh, but um, we love this scene and it's a, such a beautiful scene and um, we thought that it would be better for the whole episode. If you take a wide uh, look at the episode, it might be a little bit of something that we know already and we didn't want to make, to make the rhythm go uh, slower. So um, we took it out, but as I said, I'm not sure it was the right decision yet, but at least we have something to give it, to give to you now uh, as a as a surprise or yes, something to bridge us to to season three. Thank you for that. 
so for those of you who uh, joined the call a bit late, um, Dikla is going to stay with us till 1115 on the East Coast of the US. And so we will turn now, Dikla, um, to the questions in the group chat and we'll try to get to as many of the questions and comments as possible. Uh, thanks to those of you who asked them. Uh, the first is from uh, a WJC uh, congregate named Mark Carell. Uh, he asks, did any Orthodox community members give you feedback positive or negative about the show? Yes, very much. We got a lot of response from uh, Orthodox people and um, they were all very, very positive and very um, emotional and uh, they felt that um, that the series treated them in, in a very fair way and, and that they, that they could see themselves in, in it and uh, they felt that, that somebody wrote a true story about them. And uh, in Israel, you know, there's such a big tension between the, the two societies, the Orthodox and the secular one. And um, I, I'm, I'm hoping that this series, it was not our purpose, but, but eventually uh, from the response we got and, and from what people told us, we felt that uh, it was like a bridge, like something that brought the hearts closer to each other and made people understand each other more. It, sometimes it's all what it's needed. So, Here's a question. To be the bridge. Similar question from Sheila. Uh, Sheila asks um, or observes, I don't imagine that the Hasidic community members watch as they don't have TV. Um, have you heard that? Yes, yes, of course. I just uh, told you uh, the story before that we heard that they were actually uh, shut the screen and, and <clears throat> it became viral on the, on the cell phone, on the kosher cell phone. And people watched it on, the, on their cell phone because they don't have TV at home. <clears throat> Sorry. So, um, I, I, and I think that since then, time, times changed a little bit. And maybe now they, they are more exposed to, to some uh, content from the outside. Um, but still, it's very, uh, it's all, um, <clears throat> I think rabbis should um, approve it, and um, it's not that common that people from the uh, from the Orthodox society watch um, content from the secular society, and they uh, they have their own films. And um, but Tisel uh, got a special place there. It's very clean, even though um, still we did it was without any purpose. We, it's not that we meant to do something uh, that clean, but eventually it's without sex or violence or anything that should disturb anyone. So uh, this on one hand. And, and on the other hand, um, I think they felt uh, a very fair attitude, a very uh, realistic one without this judging uh, as, as I said before, so um, we got a very good response from the, the Orthodox Society. Thank you. Um, uh, so uh, this next question is going to put you on the spot uh, from Abigail. Um, will Elisheva be part of season three? I cannot say. I'm sorry. <laughs> I, uh, we're we're I cannot... all studying your body language right now. <laughs> Yeah, but I, I'm sorry, I cannot say this. I, I said that we have the main characters that will be uh, there for sure, but uh, for the other characters, I hope you will join us and watch and, and discover for yourself. <laughs> a, a good answer. If I were your publicist, uh, I would say thank you. You've, uh, you've given us <laughs> but. Uh, who knows whether you've told us more than you intended to tell us, but we're, we're excited that uh, you didn't uh, give that spoiler. <laughs> uh, the next question, uh, can you discuss the relationship of the brothers and, and whether there are any biblical references um, in that relationship? Wow. I don't know. Maybe. 
I I didn't hear, hear such a thing, but uh, sometimes everything has a biblical uh, reference. Um, they have a very special relationship. Of course, they love each other very much, but still the competition there, uh, especially with, uh, around the mother love, is very, very big between two of them. Um, such a beautiful way to tell a story about this competition between two brothers. Also something we know from life, this tension between love and hate and and uh, someone that you, re you feel very, very close to, but still uh, someone who can really get you out of your mind sometimes. And um, it's mostly the, the story uh, of Shulem and that his brother is coming in a storm to his life like this. And, um, and somehow he's breaking the, the normal way of things as they used to be. Um, and he has to deal with it. Um, but after all, you also feel the love or how the, their allies um, these two men. Um, so uh, a question that comes back to the Netflix piece. Um, uh, another WJC congregant uh, asked, was the Schiesel team surprised by the international success of the show? When you began it in your wildest dreams, did you ever imagine you'd be having a conversation here uh, with a synagogue in, in Westchester County, New York about this little series? Yes, very, very much. It was, um, it was a huge surprise. Uh, it was five years after the show was aired in Israel. Uh, in Israel, the, the, the response were very good, but there were not. Um, it was something that we, that, that we got from episode to episode more and more, and not in, in just one time. And, and so after five years, we sold the show to Netflix and it just explodes in a minute. And we were not ready for it at all. And we got response from all over the world, really, from people Jewish and not Jewish and from America and Australia and South America and Brazil and China and Japan. It was in Europe, of course, it was amazing. Um, we, we couldn't imagine it would be like this, like this, really. It was totally surprising and so exciting for us. Yeah, us, us as well. Uh, Jeannie Goldberg asks, um, I would like to know who is the artist of the wonderful paintings, particularly the boy with the goldfish? His name is Alex Tubis. Alex Tubis, you can look for him on Google. He's a, he's a painter, he's an artist, a very sensitive one, and he really related to the story of Stiesel very much. And uh, Akiva, uh, Michael, Michael Aloni, spent a lot of time with him, and they talked a lot about painting and about light and about compositions in the, in the painting and uh, about art. And it was a, still a very a strong connection that we have with him. And, um, and I'm lucky to have this uh, painting in my office. <laughs> with the fish, with the boy with the fish. Oh, that's, that's, that's wonderful. <laughs> um, yeah. So another question about art, this one from the, from the actual uh, show itself, uh, from Ronnie Pierce. Um, why couldn't uh, Akiva's family accept his talent and allow him to flourish? It's not common in the Orthodox society at all. Um, art is something that is not uh, popular and even get a very a negative response from, um, for example, when we went to the to to have a research and to understand how the houses of the of the um, uh, Haredi people look from the inside, we discovered there that uh, there are no 
um, aesthetic elements in it. Only uh, something that is so, um, that, that, that we have something to do with. So the, maybe it's from their modesty and they don't want um, to pay much attention to these kind of things. So um, most of the houses look very much uh, like the same as the other houses. And uh, you don't see any aesthetic, um, even not um, as photos on the wall or, or, or just, I don't know, pillows or any color. They are very, very modest. And, um, and to paint something, you know, it's also a figure of uh, image of, um, of a human being, which could be something that maybe relate to a statue that is forbidden in the Bible. And so, so many reasons, but it's totally out of, um, of, the, of the behavior in the, in the, in the Haredi society. So uh, back to your theme about mothers and sons, which we talked on earlier. Uh, from Miriam, uh, Shulem is very devoted to his mother and to her well-being, even coming in late at night to remove the TV at her urgent request. Yet he does not grant her one sincere desire to be taken to the seaside and to see the ocean. Uh, why did the writers make him hard-hearted in that instance? <laughs> what a good question. I think this is the material story is made of. Um, this is our life in a way. Um, you try really hard, you do everything. You step out of your world and your life and do all these efforts, but you miss sometimes. It's, it's, it's very human. And it's a way to tell a story that we can all identify with. Um, as much as we try to do our best, it's not always like this, and uh, and sometimes we there's there's uh, places that we think that we should do something else. We we all feel it in our in our daily life, and uh, and 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 this is the story. <laughs> yes. Um, so I just want to close uh, before I throw back to uh, Holly to say uh, thank yous and goodbyes. Um, Holly asked people, Dikla, in the chat um, to, to, to talk about their hopes and dreams for season three. Uh, we know you're well on the path to uh, having uh, scripts and, and, and ready to shoot soon, but uh, we, we have your ear and uh, we wanted to try to influence you. And so uh, Robin, Sh uh, Robin uh, Sprutz, uh, has suggested to you, I hope that Akiba continues his path as an artist and maybe marries the woman artist. And uh, we're, we're watching <laughs> your poker face here as we read these. Uh, Sidel yes. Weinberger, but, but, has, uh, she suggests that uh, to you that Akiba and Libby go to the U.S. to continue his studies, uh, but she said <laughs> to you to make sure that you know she doubts that will happen. Uh, uh, Allegra and Aria Freed. Um, I love the actress who played the widow. There's uh, Ali Sheva coming up again, uh, Akiva's first love interest. Uh, will she be coming back? We're going to protect you from that question again because we know <laughs> you will not tell us. Um, uh, one of other participants says uh, maybe Akiva has his paintings in an exhibition in London or Paris um, and comes across Ali Sheva that stirs up old emotions. Uh, Elisheva keeps coming up in the, in the chat box here and we're being uh, respectful, but we're trying to, uh, to influence. Uh, so uh, I hope you uh, appreciate uh, how much fun it is for us to imagine what it would like Very to much. be in that uh, writer, writer's room with you. And, and thank you participants in the, in the webinar for indulging uh, Holly's question. Um, Holly, I'm gonna uh, throw it back to you. Well, um, I do want to also mention that there have been a few comments about the deleted scene and someone, Sarah Balcom called it a gem. Um, and so thank you so much for sharing that scene. Um, I apologize for the technical difficulties today, but the great thing is that we got to hear so much more of your, your stories and your voice. And we're so grateful, Dikla, for you um, to be here with us today. Thank you very much. Um, Thank you all. It's a beautiful show. We're all so excited about season three. And so thank you so much. I also want to thank Jack. I also want to thank the rabbi. I want to thank all of you who came and 
who put such amazing questions and comments in our chat box. Um, and I want to remind all of you, we'll send out a link tomorrow to share with your friends and family and look for more programming like this. Um, we're so glad that you're all spending a beautiful, sunny Sunday, Sunday morning with us. It's, it's really an honor for us. So that's yes. really it. I okay, hope you it's all safe and well and take care of yourself. Please. Thank you, Dikla. Thank you, Holly and Jack. Uh, a, one, a wonderful program a, a, as always. Thank you. Thank you so much. As Dikla would say, oh, as Dikla would say, it's a wrap. <laughs> yeah. Shakaya. Yeah, Shakaya. Yeah, thank you. Thank you all. Thank you. Bye, everybody. Bye-bye, everybody. Thank you. Later. Bye-bye.